Hello, everybody. I'm excited to present at the Internet and Audiology Conference. And um, I'd like to talk about the project we are doing at home testing by cochlear implant users. But I'd also like to start uh, about fixing Internet and Audiology. And there I don't mean the conference. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this great conference and the way that we are using innovative mediums to share information, have discussions and to, uh, I hope, uh, learn a lot of things in the next days. So what I want to talk about is internet and this I want to do as parents and audiologists and, and share some of my concerns before going to the second part of this presentation and zooming into an audiological project. So uh, if there are questions, you can send them to internet audiology at computationaudiology.com. This is an email address uh, made privately by design. And the reason that I want to share some views about internet is that um, I think the ultimate uh, hallmark for quality is that if the next patient you see would be a family member or a friend, and you don't change the way you're doing or providing your care, then you're really providing the care to the best of your ability. And when using internet, I have some concerns, for instance, for my children or for family and friends, or for myself, which I think need change and which I also think need a change for professionals to be to be able to responsibly use the internet for providing hearing health care. Okay, um, so this first part of the presentation are my personal views on internet um, and at the same time I believe that we can do remote measurements in a responsible way if we keep the risks as low as reasonably achievable. And I guess that context information is really important further to make this point, but also if you want to scale up remote measurements to use it globally and maybe to use it on persons you don't know in person. But also important is that the tools that I'll use during this presentation, um, developed by Cochlear and by HearX, have been developed for screening purposes and may not maybe be ready yet for this larger vision about uh, remote hearing care. So have be aware of these limitations. Why do we need at home testing? Well, there's at least 1.3 billion people that suffer from some degree of hearing loss. And if we want to provide them optimal care, I think we cannot use the, the conventional systems we use today, because there's a lot, lack of resources, but there's uh, in, 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 in numbers of professionals that we would need to provide care to everybody, also the equipment we need, but there's also barriers to seek help. For instance, most adults with a hearing loss wait on average seven to eight years before seeking help or starting to use a hearing aid. And another thing that's getting more important these days is low touch solutions. Uh, so that uh, a visit in a hospital, if you can pre prevent it, is preferred. And probably there are many more motivations for at home testing, but these three were most important for me in the last two years. And how can we provide this at home testing? Then we need virtual and hybrid care via digital platforms. And where I say digital platforms, I mean internet. So what we need is internet suitable for medical purposes. So the question is, does internet need a fix to transform to a medical internet? And there's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself. For instance, do you entrust your personal information to the current online players? How about the risks for, for bias? That is 
many books written about it. For instance, the weapons of math destruction about what the effects are if algorithms are used for decisions, but if these algorithms are not transparent or maybe trained on biased data. Then there's privacy, which is of course really important. And I used to believe that if you solve this at the individual level, it's fine. But just to give a personal example, um, I've been using the Google engine for a couple of years. And I, first I refused to share my personal information with Google. And every other day they reminded me, do you still not want to share your personal information to enhance your search uh, services? And after a couple of months, I surrendered because I uh, was fetched up with always refusing the cookies. And since the day that I accepted those cookies, they never sent me a reminder if I wanted to continue sharing my private information. And that brings me to a couple of other important issues like uh, the balance of, of power and net neutrality. Uh, balance of power is that the problem that a few very powerful players can, um, can more or less design the rules how we play it now. And I think this imbalance is a risk since it may prevent us from taking the interests of all stakeholders into account. So all internet users and in medical use, of course, the patients, the clinicians, but also society at large who is paying for part of these services. And what's also important is net neutrality. And then I mean access, for instance, to services. And some of these dominant players are so powerful that they can even refuse the president of the United States to make use of their services uh, and ban somebody's Twitter account. So imagine that there's a critical service healthcare service and it's yeah, not everybody has access to it and if not everybody has access to it that then it's still important that who is making up these rules and who is also um, safeguarding these rules and how can we deal with sources of information and who can you trust and I admit it's getting more and more difficult these days yeah, when there's people sharing conspiracy theories by the internet about anti faxes etc., etc. And there's also a lot of great scientific talks. It's, it's a lot of information, and it's so much information that you need support or help by others, I think, to find the information that's suitable for you. And then there's also the question, how can you even choose with whom to interact and also influence the way how you are treated so that services are provided tailored to your, need, to your needs, but also, yeah, maybe the cost, if, if remote care would be cheaper, can you then still uh, refuse for remote care if you don't feel comfortable with the solution? And imagine for, uh, for instance, that schools, hospitals, and highways are all uh, assets from big corporations and they are used to maximize shareholder value. What would, how would that society look like? And now, just make it digital. I think that's already used, uh, uh, happening. So we have to think about how to design the digital equivalents of schools and hospitals and uh, ways of transport and communication. And it may add also the aspect of digital well-being. Yeah, that besides a physical well-being, due to the importance of digital presence, I think if your instance are followed by internet trolls, that may affect how you are feeling and may affect uh, your your mind and a physical body. So we have to think about how to deal with these uh, threats maybe for your digital well-being or the risk of living in a very tiny digital bubble uh, oblivious to maybe the lives of others. So how can you give 
a good assessment of the situation of uh, a patient in front of you if you do not know much about that patient and about maybe the bubble that person is living in. So I believe that as long as a few actors dominate social media and the internet, we cannot develop a secure and neutral internet suitable for remote medical care. So we will need to go to an internet that shares sens sensations very rapidly across the globe to one that shares sensible information. And to do so, we need to take the interest of all stakeholders into account. And if we zoom into the problem of the problem of developing remote care, then for remotely performed hearing assessments, we do need to know the context and the user uh, who you're collecting data from. So in the context, I mean that a hearing test that its outcome may be invalid if the measurement is done in a noisy environment or if the procedure was not clear to the user or there was a lack of attention, faulty hardware, etc. There's many reasons we can think of why a measurement is invalid. And that's something that's important for all medical domains, the context for, for where the measurement has been performed. For instance, in monitoring vital signs, an increased heart rate may indicate that a person is at risk when the person is in a hospital bed. However, when that person is at home and climbing a, a stair, well, then uh, an increased heart rate may not be so big of a deal. And I'm sure that this context is collected by players like for Facebook. And they know for many people a lot of things because we sometimes share it purposefully and sometimes we share it without being aware of it. Then the user, for instance, if you diagnose a hearing loss, there's many factors that are important. For instance, age or genetic uh, disposition. And the consequences of somebody's hearing loss, of course, depends very much on how that person is living, what desires that person and ambitions that person has, and also where you are, that person is going to do uh, the things he or she wants to do. That again um, goes for medical, many medical domains that personal information is needed for interpretation and not only for the medical care, but also for the social care. And so it will be important for both healthcare and social care organizations to be able to share information to provide optimal care. And here again, I'm sure that Facebook and others have access to a lot of vital personal information. So now here's then the ultimate test. I would like to invite you to try a remote measurement via a headset yourself and to experience it, to see how it, how it goes and try to imagine for yourself what it could be, mean for one of your patients or maybe uh, family members. And imagine what a colleague of you would need to properly assess the measurement. Um, so I'll provide you a, a link so that you can do the test. The outcome of the test will only be visible to me or persons I trust. And if you are uh, privacy sensitive, you may choose just to share a phony name and a phony phone number. Um, and the objectives for you to learn would be to well, be able to explain the digits in noise test, um, which will be explained also on this page, but I'm sure that there's a lot of people that would need another uh, set of instructions to properly do the test. Uh, well, and the other uh, objectives I already mentioned. And these kinds of tests, I think, might fit into a digital care pathway, um, where the patient can test at what time he or she wants to do the test, maybe also at what location, but that will depend probably also on the location, where a local clinician can assess the outcome and maybe provide care or counsel, or can seek help from a remote expert for further advice for maybe 
uh, analyzing some uh, trends in the data. And to do this on a large scale, we need algorithmic support and automation of a lot of the tasks at hand. Um, well, this model may work, but I believe we need to address a lot of concerns before we can really use it. So here's then the project, uh, part two of the presentation. And um, it's a project at, about at home measurements, uh, which I do with a couple of colleagues, Wendy, Lucas, and Doreen. Uh, again, you can still use the email address for your questions. And uh, here's some examples of at home measurements of audiometry in persons with profound hearing loss. So there's uh, a silver lining here that persons with this profound hearing loss do have possibly less problems with environmental noise that has less effect on their hearing test. But of course, many other factors may still uh, affect the outcome, eh? like learning the test procedure, circadian rhythm, attention for the test, fatigue. And by collecting multiple measurements, we would like to try to be able in the future to reduce unnecessary variability, increase maybe the test accuracy if needed, and we may be able to assess trends that are unseen in a single measurement. And what you see here in this graph is an example of circadian rhythm um, by plotting the core body temperature that fluctuates a little bit over time when you're awake. And it peaks after more or less three hours on average in most persons. And that is the moment that you are at your best for cognitive and physical uh, tasks. So that's, that may have an effect, of course, also on the test outcome. What's also important is how people are, are doing eh, in, in, in general. So we want to have some benchmark. That's the reason why we also ask people to fill out a questionnaire uh, where they self-report about the concentration, motivation, physical activity and fatigue over the last two weeks. And that's data we can compare with healthy persons and uh, also with people with some hearing loss. And here's then the study protocol. What we do is we administer nine hearing test batteries. I'll explain what kind of tests are included uh, in the next slides. We also uh, do this survey the, uh, about uh, the subjective fatigue. And um, what you see here is how we have made the schedule for the nine measurements. Um, and by choosing these different moments, we can, for instance, have a look at test retest effects of the morning versus uh, within a session by doing two tests in the morning consecutively versus between sessions by comparing the outcomes in the morning at different uh, days. And also we can have a look at, oh, sorry, circadian rhythm by looking at outcome compared between morning, noon and night. And then three months after the start of the um, uh, measurements, we do a, again a full measurement, including also the, the subjective fatigue survey. So what does the test battery include? Um, well, this full uh, test battery includes uh, six uh, different tests or tasks that I will explain. Um, but before every measurement, we also ask a couple of questions to assess the state of a subject by how motivated they are now to do the test, also how fit they feel at that moment, and right after the test they need to uh, assess how much effort it took to do the test and if they want to give up, which is maybe a proxy for uh, the listening effort they have invested. And the test itself, it's called the remote check, uh, which is developed by uh, Cochlear. And people are asked to make a photo of the area where there's the implant. They also need to fill out two questionnaires, including questions from the SSQ about, for instance, uh, what listening problems they experience in daily life. They need to do 
uh, an audiogram, which is done by streaming sound from an iPhone to the implants. And the advantage is that we don't have any problem with calibration because we have a well defined hardware. And um, another test is the speech and noise. In this case, the, the digits of noise that yeah, you will be able to try yourself. And then there's another questionnaire and there's an impedance uh, check. And for the short version of the remote check, we only let people do the audiogram testing, speech and noise, and the impedance check. That takes well, between five and 10 minutes in total. I cannot share yet the, the results of our study, but I can share some lessons learned. So what we see is that multiple tests a day is possible. Also that you can give the instructions via email and via messengers. And that way you can do a totally virtual assessment. Um, but still it's important who you are testing and to give the proper instructions and where that person is doing the test. Also sometimes of uh, technical issues, uh, Bluetooth signal that's, uh, for instance, prone to uh, interference with other devices. Uh, we feel that this instant messaging with subjects is really helpful because we can give them reminders to prepare for the next uh, test, but also they can, if there's a problem, um, almost instantly ask for our feedback and we can just ask them also, for instance, at what time they expect to get up and if that's at seven o'clock and they start the test and what time they uh, start the test that we can be uh, standby during this uh, test. Um, well, the CIS questionnaire seems to be sensitive to measure chronic fatigue, but it's too early to make uh, definite conclusions here. There's also uh, some constraints, uh, for instance, the digital proficiency. Hey? I was already explaining it's important to know who you are testing. For instance, uh, we had this experience that we asked people to make a screenshot when they ran into a problem during the test. And then the response was, yeah, what's a screenshot? And we had to first to explain how to make a screenshot with your iOS device, and then share this photo via, photo via the messenger. Um, but that's, I think, something we can deal with, that the, all the subjects so far uh, was almost 80 years old and many older participants have experience as grand, uh, parents with using these uh, devices with, in communication with grandchildren. Um, so far this test only works on iOS devices, so that means uh, a lot of our patients cannot use the service yet. Uh, and we have suffered some technical problems um, especially the connection between the iPhone and the cochlear implant processor. But I'm uh, confident that most of these issues will be resolved soon. Well, thank you for your attention. Um, please let me know if you have questions. And um, I hope we can also use the interactive uh, session at the conference. Uh, earlier this year in February, I provided a, a talk more about ecologically valid measurements, but with also a lot of overlap with today's talk. Um, and I'm preparing uh, a talk more about online tools and resources. So uh, I hope uh, to talk to you again in the future. Thank you for your attention.